Welcome back to this I-24 News Evening Edition. This is One on One. Joining me tonight is a special guest, Mr. Edwin Black, an award-winning New York Times best-selling author with investigative books published in 14 languages around the world. Black's works focuses on a range of controversial issues from cooperate uh, genocide and include the uncovering of IBM's relationship with the Nazi regime and more and more and more. First of all, thank you very much for coming to our studio. It's a great pleasure. Lucy, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So uh, you covered so many subjects. You uh, wrote about so many controversial issues. You discovered so many things that did headlines all around the world. What is your most shocking reveal uh, from everything that you've done until now? Well, obviously, the single greatest shock in my career was to find out that IBM had organized, co-organized, and co-planned all six phases of the Holocaust, and that the Auschwitz tattoo was an I, a, a began as an IBM number. But in general, all of my books basically look at a forest, often a forest right in front of most people, but people fail to see the trees. And I see the trees, I examine them closely, and I find that sometimes these trees give green and sometimes they give darkness. When you're talking about people who don't see the trees, who don't see the picture, who are you talking? Well, let's take IBM and the Holocaust. Uh, the first thing you saw when you walked into the Holocaust Museum was the IBM machine. Six million people saw it before I, before I did. No one bothered to, uh, uh, to ask the question, what was this machine used for? And of course, we found out that IBM consciously, directly from New York under the micromanagement of its president, Thomas J. Watson, actually co-organized and co-planned all six phases of the Holocaust and had a, a customer site in every concentration camp. So no one asked the question. So one of the things that I do is I ask the question that people have failed to ask and I provide the answers that are sometimes very, un very uncomfortable. And that is the approach I took to financing the flames. Uh, I, I came to Israel and uh, I looked at the human rights uh, situation here. Obviously, having covered human rights for 45 years, uh, Sunni, Shia, uh, Appalachians, Africans, Jews in the Shoah, uh, Native Americans, just people of all types, I was very fam uh, familiar with the um, uh, strides and objectives of the human rights movement. And what I saw here in Israel was that the human rights movement has been kidnapped, abducted. By whom? By whom? By uh, 501c3 charitable organizations in the United States with a political agenda. This includes uh, the George Soros Open Society Foundations, the New Israel Fund, the Ford Foundation, and many other groups who are using taxpayer money in the United States, tax deductions, to implement a well-funded war chest for political agitation in Israel. And in the process, they are um, giving Israel a black eye, and they're making it that much more difficult for peace and reconciliation to take place between Arabs and Israelis in this land. There are many Arabs and many Israelis who wish to live in peace, but they can't because these organizations make it impossible for them. Is it only the organization or is it only or is it the picture that people are seeing from outside that it's got nothing to do with what is happening actually in reality? Well, it's both. And of course, this is the point when we explain it isn't the New Israel Fund by itself. The New Israel Fund is funding, financing some 800 NGOs in Israel. Many of them are doing very noble, noble work, such as uh, helping uh, inequality between ethnic groups, g giving advantage to women who desperately need it, especially in cases of uh, battered women. 
but scores of them, scores of them, are engaged in agitation activities with a distinct political agenda that are making it very difficult for uh, Israel to implement its desire for peace and for Arabs to come to terms with Israel. Well, what you're saying is very worrying because uh, basically this is uh, maybe what Israel is not realizing about its advocacy outside. It cannot actually, maybe instead of doing good publicity for Israel, they're doing bad publicity for well, Israel. Well, I think publicity is what we're talking about. Now, I base my remarks on the statements given to me on the record by senior parliamentarians in the Knesset, such as Yoni Chet Boon, the deputy speaker, such as many military men, and they all seem to say the same thing, that the New Israel Fund, through its grantees, uh, according to them, was working to destabilize the IDF and to uh, erase the Jewish identity from the state of Israel. The code word for this is a democratic state. But what is really meant, according to these, to, to these people here, is wipe away the Jewish identity. Judaism in a Jewish state is completely consistent with democratic values. There are uh, uh, Christian democratic states. There are, uh, is, there are Islamic democratic states, for instance, in Turkey, at least that's the theory. And it is an objective that all people want. There's no need to wipe away the Jewish identity from Israel in order to achieve democracy. But can you, um, can you, is these two words going together? Because you are saying there's no need to, to, to demolish this word, to uh, wipe out this word. But can these two words, when you have a minority of 20% inside Israel who's not Jewish, can it be, go together, democratic and Jewish? Oh, of course. The issue is pluralism. Uh, Israel uh, is a democratic state with a pluralistic point of view that recognizes minority rights in a region where minority rights are, are often an excuse for massacres and, and uh, persecutions. Uh, Israel is a state that inculcates the whole essence, the whole quintessence of the democratic spirit. It's imperfect. Trust me, it's imperfect. The United States has been working at this for about two and a half centuries, and we're still a work in progress. Uh, American blacks uh, only got the vote uh, in my lifetime in the 20th century. Israel's been working at this for two and a half generations, and it's a work in progress. Remember, it's an ancient land and a whole new setting, and it is, cop and it is coping with its past and its enticing uh, future. Now, one of the things that's creating a bar for this is the BDS movement. And here we have, this is on everybody's tongue, that what is the BDS movement and who's operating it and who's financing it and who's giving it its impetus. Here we have, here I have to say that with the investigation that I did, I found that the New Israel Fund was inseparable from the international BDS movement, in my opinion. One of the reasons is that they robustly funded, with large grants, an organization called the Coalition of Women for Peace. And these people set up an international infrastructure uh, to identify and boycott Israeli goods. They even set up uh, something called Who Profits. Now, in order for a BDS or a boycott or delegitimization uh, movement to take place, it needs a couple of things. One, it needs an allegation of a violation of international law. That's disputable. And the other it needs is exactly what you said, Lucy. It needs this bad image. It needs this image of brutality. And the way you achieve that image of brutality is by provoking it. And we do see provocation here. We see uh, an organization called B'Tselem, which has been given cameras, courtesy of the American taxpayer and other groups who are funding it. And while B'Tselem does some very good and valuable work in this country, some of its volunteers, for instance, in Nabi Sela, are dancing around the soldiers, keeping cameras right next to their nose, pushing their kids into M16s, using their children as human shields, insulting the soldier's mother, insulting all, the, all, all these guys. You, Justin and Lucy, you? You, you couldn't do that to a traffic cop in, down, in downtown Chicago or midtown Manhattan without getting you, arrested. And, and so how can you fight this? 
How can you deal with this? Well, the How first you... the first thing you do is you say, this is an activity that is not a charitable act. And a charitable act is what's at the essence of my book. Are, these, are, are the groups funded by the New Israel Fund that are not engaged in helping battered women and delinquent children, are these politicized agitation NGOs worthy of an American tax deduction? For every million dollars that the New Israel Fund, George Soros Open Society Foundations, and the uh, Ford Foundation pump into these NGOs, each taxpayer in America subsidizes with $440,000. Now, that's not a fair fight for a soldier sitting at a crossroads in uh, Nabi Sela trying to protect the, high, the, the highway, and he has to fight millions and millions of and dollars I, of American and, and funding. I ask you, and I ask you, how do you think and you can paint a good picture of an occupation? You know, the Palestinians will sit down, they're looking at us right now, and they will tell, but we are being, uh, we are living under an occupation occupied uh, authority. We are, the Israelis are occupying the West Bank. How can you paint a good picture when soldiers are actually occupying people who well, are living in a conflict? Well, the first thing you do is you don't make it worse. It is an occupation. It's a long legal question as to whether uh, whose land this is. Remember, where does international law start on the West Bank? Do you know? Treaty of San Treaty of San Remo, March 24th, 1920, which was then adopted by fifth by 52 nations, became uh, uh, Article 6 of the, that became in, uh, in international law and proposed that uh, Jews should be facilitated to set up land on all um, un, uh, unused state lands. Remember, this was Turkish land yes. for a half a millennium. 500 years. The first Turkish land registration was done in 1859 according to the Turkish Land Registration Act. Years, yes. So in 1920, we have this effort to settle the unused lands. The unused lands were generally the hilltops, the unused hilltops. When the Israelis come into these lands, they are obligated not to put in Israeli law, but to recognize the pre-existing law. The pre-existing law was, in fact, the Jordanian occupation law, the, in, the international mandate for Palestine, which was under Britain, and, of course, the Ottoman Land Registration Act. They can't have the same law. And, and now what do you have? Right now, we have a sovereignty limbo. We have a, we have a piece of land that could have been declared a Palestinian state in 1920 in San Remo. They got, you... in, in 1937 during the Peel Commission, in 1948 during the, uh, uh, par the, during the partition plan, in 1967, in, uh, at any point. And right, and right now you look at a, country, at a factory like, um, like SodaStream, and SodaStream if it was run by Mormons from Salt Lake City or Mennonites from Indiana or Catholic nuns from Poland, they'd be up for, um, for a Nobel well, Prize. Before... But, but instead, they say it's an international war crime. Why? Because they're Jewish. I will put another another maybe obstacle before we're finishing uh, on the table. When you're traveling, when you're traveling around Israel, when you're going to the settlements, when you're, I believe that you're visiting the West Bank, you're seeing what is happening all around. You don't think that a Palestinian country already exists? It's only a matter of discussing right now the borders, because you see, uh, when you, you even just land in Israel okay, okay. from the map. You oh, see a okay. divided... Do you, do you actually believe that this is about a few meters? Do you actually... So be, what it is about. Do, do you actually believe that the reason that there's been this war of this intensity with this much bloodshed is because two people can't figure out a distance between my chair and the door? how to divide that up, a property dispute, a, a border dispute. So this, in 30 seconds, what it is about? This is about hatred, 
that must be overcome. And it can be overcome if the powers of peace are allowed to thrive, let people coexist, live side by side in equality and respect, and not finance the flames where everyone is, where peace does not pay, and where people are rewarded for confrontation, and in some cases, in the case of the Palestinian terrorist salaries, they're even rewarded with a monthly check for terrorism. Uh, Edwin Black, first of all, I want to uh, present, before we're finishing, Financing Flames, uh, your latest uh, book, right? I'm not, I'm not correct. This is your book. Thank you very much for coming. I could maybe still... Oh, we can talk on, for a few more we can, hours. A few more hours. I we know. have a lot of issues to well, yeah, uh, talk questions. about. But uh, thank you very much for this uh, interview. Thank you for coming to our studios. Hope to have you again here. Lucy, thank you as well. Thank you. And thank you, our viewers, for being with us tonight. Tomorrow we will be here at the same time, same place from the Jeff Port, Israel. Have a great day.